Thank you for watching, liking, commenting, sharing, and subscribing right now. So we're here outside of the Freescale Technology Forum, a uh, nice, super nice con con conference center, and you work for Ubuntu. Yes, I work for Canonical. Canonical, you're yeah. making Ubuntu and making it work with the partners, right? Yes. So what kind of challenges have you had to try and make it work on the Ampar laptops? So with ARM, uh, there's kind of different challenges. I mean, Intel, for instance, has had a, quite a while to set standards and have like a standard boot process or even how acceleration goes in some ways, where ARM is kind of a, a different beast and it's really been for the embedded space only. So now when you try to take it to the desktop space where folks have different expectations of, okay, I should be able to boot a CD, boot a USB stick, you know, right from the BIOS, for instance, that's kind of an expectation people have for x86. That's not there for ARM, for all things ARM. So, you know, one of the key things with ARM uh, SOCs or like Freescale or all the other uh, SOC vendors is they don't have like a standard way of doing their boot up process. So they all use different firmwares for boot up. Some use U-Boot uh, as the firmware that seems to be the most popular, but you have Red Boot and you also even have some proprietary uh, firmware loaders that you know they load and they don't quite do it in the same way where you can load a USB stick or anything. Some of them you have to like the, write the kernel raw to disk to be able to read it. So that from a lot of these firmwares, you have to actually directly read a kernel, uh, which, which is the same as x86. But x86, you have you either put it on the MBR or you set a active partition, and in the first five, 12 bytes, you have um, you know where you're going to boot. So on ARM, is <laughs> because of the different firmwares, yeah. and none of those follow kind of the same cadence. So and with like U-Boot, for instance, you have the ability to mount a file system. So I can just have a kernel on that file system and then have you boot loaded up. On others, you may not have that ability, and so that make, this makes it even more challenging in that the way, you, how do you update that you know, from the file system? Is that one of the challenges you're trying to fix with the partners in, in Linaro, in the, that project? Is that one of part of it? Yeah, so as you know, Freescale you know, showed today during the keynote, uh, yesterday uh, during the keynote was a Linaro, and that's actually you know, ARM, at Freescale, IBM, and many other partners around ARM to basically help make standards for ARM, either standard, uh, standardized on U-Boot or there's been talk of UEFI, for instance, going that route and that way all SOCs can go one route, one boot process and give the, give, uh, well, basically cut costs down on enablement. How about the Ubuntu Software Center? Uh, there's lots of apps on x86. How many apps work on ARM for laptops? Uh, for the most part, anything that's in the main repositories is compiled for ARM. Uh, when you start going to universe is when it, it gets a little bit shaky. Yeah. Uh, but most of the, anything that's in the main repositories is compiled for ARM. So uh, thousands of apps are there? Yes. Um, I can't say off of head, but there, there are quite a few. So quite a few apps. And most apps you know, that people really like to use are there. Nice. And um, so, so now to, to get it working, the best way to get it working would yeah. be uh, the ARM Cortex A9, right? Uh, yeah, it seems as though uh, you know, we've been working quite a few SOC vendors, Freescale being one, but um, we've, you know, most of the designs that have come out right now have all been Cortex A8 based. Um, these weren't necessarily designed with netbooks in mind initially, a lot of the SOC parts, but uh, all the SOC vendors have kind of learned and seen, you know, okay, here are the kind of deficiencies, and so a lot of the work that's gone to the A9s are basically to take care of the problem that they found with the A8s. So, so the A8s have not been kind of able to reach the market so far, but yeah. the A9, the hope is that now it's going to be fast enough for everything. Exactly, and, and the key really there is uh, faster bus speeds uh, with a lot of the SOCs that will be produced. That's been one of the kind of the bottlenecks is I.O. Uh, and, you know, the, the RAM, uh, bus to the RAM has not been very fast. That'll be a lot faster. Um, the other key thing is multi-core. So A9, Cortex A9 chips bring about multi-core processing. So that is that like multi-threading? Yeah, so well, you have actually multi multiple cores. Uh, and there's a lot of folks in the Intel world, you're used to that you know, by now, having multiple cores. Well, now the ARM chips will have multiple cores as well. So could you say, because you're playing with all these uh, secret prototypes, could you mm -hmm. say that it's actually faster than the Intel Atom? I can't say that. I can't say that for sure. Yeah. Um, that's going to vary, obviously, to you know what frequency each SOC vendor uh, brings their Cortex A9 to. But uh, you will definitely see uh, it'll be definitely comparable. To Consumers will think it's fast enough for for every the full desktop experience. Yes, and, and even for the A8 that that are around right now for the Cortex A8, like the, the Freescale MX51. Um, reference design we're showing in there from Pegatron. It's a really good experience. 
um, though you can see the loading times can be a little bit long on, on some cases and that's part of that memory bus not being fast enough. Is a, is a Chrome browser faster than the Firefox and ARM? Uh, yes, there's, there's a lot of, and actually Freescale mentioned that about Lenaro. Um, one of their key things is uh, working with you know the Chrome community and making it very optimized for ARM. And there is some work going on uh, also, and uh, they're also you know working with Firefox, uh, the Mozilla Most Foundation that, yeah. as well. But as we've all seen, you know Chrome runs pretty fast. Because it's a pretty important app to have a good browser, right? Yes. And then uh, what else do we need? Do you have the full? How do you uh, use the hardware acceleration to, to make it speedy and all that? Ah, so that that's a, another area where there's been kind of contention, and uh, one of the reasons why it's so it's taken so long for these to come to market is. Should like, we walk up? Oh, oh yeah. again? Oh, yeah. you wanna? No, oh. let's let's continue. Oh, okay. So one of the reasons it's taken so long. Sorry. Oh no, it's because of Adobe. So you know everybody's been waiting. You know, right now the web is still about um, Flash. Yeah, you know, YouTube, Flash, Hulu, Flash, can't get away from that. And these SOC parts, <laughs> these uh, the SOC parts can't. Uh, the, so the ARM chips, the ARM cores, aren't necessarily fast enough to um, run it. But what that lacks, they have uh, integrated VPUs, which are video processing units. And yeah. so each SOC vendor has a different VPU, so they have to work to enable Flash to use that VPU. And so when you have something like Hulu or whatnot, it's completely accelerated and you don't, you don't, you know, see a difference and, you know, you, you basically get, you know, same performance as you would an Intel machine. So the flash is being solved, but how about other things in the OS? Are there other things you need hardware acceleration for? Oh. Uh, like the interfaces of Ubuntu, anything like that? Or uh, oh, the browser? Right. So, so one of the other key things with ARM that's a deficiency is 3D. So yeah. a lot of the SOC vendors, um, the you know the video processing unit or the GPU yeah. uh, is in the SOC, and there really hasn't been a focus on writing to Xorg essentially. So okay. now there's a because these you know you have to remember these chips were designed for cell phones or other things. So you can basically you just need all right, just give me a buffer and I just write to it, and that's how most cell phones work. But with something like Ubuntu, we use Xorg. So we need a whole. We need Xorg drivers, uh, and we need uh, kernel level drivers uh, that support this. So you can get you know true 3D multi windowing and whatnot. And as you've seen some of the new experiences from Ubuntu, those highly depend on 3D experiences. It's having 3D support. Nice. So uh, do you think that? Uh, do you honestly think that this is a good potential right now for Canonical to? Uh, reach a huge mass market because so far there has been some kind of uh, breaks or something going on where basically Microsoft always comes there and, and has their windows available and people use it you know on the networks yeah. people have thought in the beginning maybe it would be a breakthrough for, for Linux right uh, I, and, uh, I, I, do you think the ARM powered now is a good opportunity yeah but even now I mean there's still a breakthroughs and, and many other countries outside of the US for instance um, Ubuntu is very popular so, but as much in the U.S., there's still Microsoft has you know still quite a stronghold on you know folks need Windows, and so you know that's why we've come up with something like Ubuntu Lite to give those folks with Windows the opportunity to try Ubuntu in a nice, safe environment. But you're saying it's very popular. What does that mean? Uh, uh, so How essentially, many? well, I mean, so the the classic story in the U.S. especially is if you go to a university, for instance, you're required to have Microsoft Word. You know, and there's and if you're a student, it's it's great that you want to use Ubuntu, and there's a lot of students who will dual boot, but they're still stuck to the fact that if they want to pass the class, they better use Microsoft Word. Yeah. So. Is it going to be good enough to use it inside of Citrix or some kind of virtualization like that? Oh yeah, you'll. I mean, if Citrix writes a client for it, then yes. Um, and I believe they have an ARM client right now. Uh, so yes, there is a there's an ARM client already that will run on Ubuntu ARM. Is it going to uh, be just as fast as a real Word? Oh well, if you're using Citrix, you're going to a remote server, so that's you know that's, it's, it's going to depend on how fast that server is. All Citrix related is a, a viewer to that server. And uh, and all the work that you're doing at Canonical is open source, kind of, right? Yes. So well, it means that Google is really using a lot of it, right? Uh, yeah. They just trying to they take could. it. They potentially they could, um, but then again, you know, um, you know, if you just take it, you still you know have to support it. Yeah. So that's the, kind of the key behind Canonical is we are the guys that folks can come to and actually get support from 
you know, for that OS of whatever level that they're using Ubuntu. Because you really did help, officially you announced that you did help Google with the Chrome OS uh, uh, in the beginning for x86, right? Did you also help uh, them with the ARM? Um, we helped them, we mainly helped them, not really for x86 or ARM, we mainly helped them uh, a lot in the building build area and helped them build up things uh, to where they are now. Uh, I'm not sure where things are, at, you know, with Google Chrome OS now, yeah. but they're, you know, they've got something coming around. Cool. So looking forward to a $199 uh, ARM Cortex A9, Ubuntu <laughs> laptops, and like dozen huge manufacturers very soon. We'll we'll see there. Um, I think as, as you've seen the designs uh, um, that we've been showing here, it's very thin, very sexy, and with that you can really play around with a lot of like making sexy designs, whatnot. And some uh, bigger manufacturers may feel that that sexiness will have a premium to it, almost an Apple-like premium to it, because it'll be a very nice experience, something that a lady could even put in her purse. It's so thin, so light. It's so new, so no different. Less. Yeah, so, so new. So they're going to take advantage of the margins that they can take, especially in the beginning, right? Potentially, potentially. Yeah. Though you'll still, you may have other manufacturers who are shooting for the lower end price point. So, and the I think it's a wait and see. And, uh, so you are really, you, you, your work is to travel to Taiwan and you, you meet all these partners, so you are yes. experiencing a lot of things right now. Yeah, so I, I, I meet with the partners, some of our biggest uh, customers, and also some of the ISPs as well. So that's the other thing about ARM is getting the, you know, Adobe's uh, and anybody else who, uh, you know, makes major applications to, to, to write them for ARM as well. And this is an opportunity for them to make huge profit margins because on the, on the Intel Atom, there isn't that much to make, actually. Uh, potentially, yeah. I mean, uh, they, they can make huge profit margins. It's just a matter of the acceptance and how consumers accept them. I mean, the, one of the key things that most manufacturers have been afraid of with the ARM uh, netbooks, or they call them smart books, for a specific reason that if someone, they call it the soccer mom syndrome. Uh, soccer mom goes to Target, she sees one of these things, and she sees a clamshell machine. She automatically assumes that it's Windows. And the second she gets it and there's software that she can't run on it, she returns it. And it's not that it was a bad experience, it's not yeah. that there was anything wrong with it, it just wasn't what she expected. So trying to, on a marketing side, let the consumer know that, hey, you're buying something different that's not Windows, is one of the challenges of a lot of these ARM, ARM, ARM netbooks, the user uh, smart books. interface experience and all that. And that's what you may be trying with Ubuntu Lite, right? Uh, Ubuntu Lite, we're given the best of both worlds. We're basically saying, hey, we understand Windows is important to you, or even some many cases, um, one of the whole reasons Ubuntu Lite came around is, uh, you know, users have to use it. They're, they're required either by a corporation, their, corp their company, uh, corporate IT policies or whatnot, but they're in an airport or they're in an environment that they feel unsafe. So they can basically open their, you know, enable Ubuntu Lite under Windows, and it actually is kind of a dual boot system, uh, and it basically enables you to be able to choose, all right, I want to use Ubuntu Lite, and then have an environment where, okay, I feel safe enough to where if something does happen here, um, you know, it, it can happen, and, and, and I think things will be okay, and my Windows partition will still be just fine. Uh, and that's kind of the idea now. Of course, they will be safe, because, you know, really don't have too many issues. Uh, under Ubuntu, uh, under Ubuntu Lite, and that's what, one of the reasons we created is to give them a, a safe environment to use. Cool, so looking forward to the results of your work and yeah, all that. Yeah. Real products, soon. <laughs>